submitted for the academic degree of the candidate of sciences in physics and mathematics. The specialization is 010407, condensed metaphysics. The topic of the thesis is influence of temperature and oxygen on graphene and hexagonal uh, uh, boron nitride uh, monolayers formed on lattice meshed metallic substrates. Under the order issued by St. Petersburg State University as of December 30th, 2020, number 12265-1, I, Alexander Vinogradov, Doctor of Sciences in Physics and Mathematics, a professor of the Solid State Electronics Department of St. Petersburg State University, have been appointed the chairperson of this dissertation board. The order also approved the candidacies of the members of our board, and let me introduce them. Andrei Pavlichev, a Doctor of Sciences in Physics and Mathematics, Professor of the Solid State Electronics Department of St. Petersburg State University. Uh, the following members of the board are working remotely today. That's Yelena Filatova, Doctor of Sciences in Physics and Mathematics, Professor of the Solid State Electronics Department of St. Petersburg State University. Yelena, do you see us and hear us? Yes? Yes, I do. Okay, the answer is yes. Alexander Katrup, Doctor of Sciences in Physics and Mathematics, Professor, Head of the Functional Materials Chemistry Department of the Nikolaev Institute of Inorganic Chemistry, Siberian branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Alexander, do you see us and hear us? Yes, yes, I do. Okay, thank you. And Alexander Grunois, PhD, University of Cologne, Germany. Alexander, do you see us and hear us? Yes. Yes, Alexander said yes as well. Okay. And we also have our candidate for the degree, Viktor Shevelev. And we also have the thesis supervisor. Professor Dmitry Usachov, Doctor of Sciences in Physics and Mathematics, Professor of the Solid State Electronics Department of St. Petersburg State University. Uh, dear colleagues, in case I have a technical failure, I ask Andrei Pavlichev to announce a technical break. If we won't manage to restore the connection, then Andrei, I kindly ask you to chair the board meeting. Do you agree? Uh, yes, yes, I do. It's okay. Uh, distinguished members of the board, uh, do you agree with that proposal? Yes? Alexander, what about you? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Professor Grunes, do you agree with yes, that proposal? I agree. Okay. Uh, so, dear colleagues, who are working in the remote mode? In order to improve the quality of our connection, I kindly ask you to turn off your microphones, but don't forget to turn them on when I give you the floor. I would also like to inform you that um, the panel session of our dissertation board is being recorded and broadcast on the St. Petersburg State University website, and it is also interpreted from Russian into English and vice versa. Uh, currently, we have an email address posted on the page with live broadcast of uh, the board session. And all listeners can submit their questions and opinions to Mr. Shevelev online, the questions regarding the thesis or the scientific discussion. And thus they can participate in our discussion. These questions will be forwarded to me by our technical service, and I will read them out during the discussion. Uh, the questions must be related to the presentation and the content of the thesis. And uh, do not uh, forget to give your name and position if you submit a question. Uh, questions that have nothing to do with uh, the scientific discussion or the dissertation text um, will not be voiced, as well as anonymous questions. And under the order on the procedure of granting academic degrees at St. Petersburg State University approved by local normative acts, the session of the dissertation board is valid, providing two-thirds of the appointed uh, board members are present. The total number is not to be fewer than four people. Our dissertation board consists of five people, 
Everyone is with us today, including four members of the board who are working remotely. And we have a multimedia connection with all the members of the board, as well as with our candidate for the degree. Uh, therefore, we have a quorum. Our session uh, should not last more than two hours, and uh, the agenda is as follows. First, the chairman's presentation about the documents submitted by the candidate for the degree and their conformity with the requirements, and uh, chairman's replies to questions, if any. Five minutes for that. Then, the candidate's short presentation providing an overview and findings of the research. 15 minutes, roughly, for that. Then, questions to the candidate regarding the presentation. No more than two minutes per question. Then, candidates' replies to the questions. Five minutes for all the questions. Then, reports on the thesis. The board members will be taking the floor in turns to provide their reviews and questions to um, uh, to the candidate for the degree, 10 minutes per speaker. Next comes the chairman's report on the thesis, 10 minutes for that as well. Then are the candidate's comments about the reports on the thesis and replies to questions, 20 minutes for that. Then we are going to have an open discussion. Anyone present at the defense may state their position or, or ask questions on the thesis. So two minutes per uh, speaker. And I kindly ask you to fill in the registration form and introduce yourself before I give you the floor, if you want to participate in the open discussion. Then the chairman will ask the questions submitted during the broadcast uh, via our website. I beg your pardon. And I would like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, those submitted written questions that take more than two minutes to be read out will not be voiced. Uh, next, we will listen to candidates' replies to the questions, then the presentation of, of candidates' thesis supervisor. Then oh, we're going to have a five-minute discussion before the open balloting on conferring or non-conferring the academic degree. And the discussion of these results of the defense is not broadcast. Then oh, we're going to have open balloting, uh, vote counting, and uh, recording of the results into the protocol. Then we are making a decision on whether to confer the academic degree or not. And finally, we are going to listen to the candidate's closing speech. No more than two minutes for that. So, distinguished colleagues, any questions or comments on our agenda? Okay. As far as I understand, there are no questions. In this case, let us proceed. But before we do that, I kindly ask you to switch off the sound on your mobile phones. And I ask those colleagues who are working remotely today not to put away their mobile phones uh, so that we could contact you in case of technical failure. That's it. Thank you. So let me start my presentation. So the thesis uh, by Viktor Shevelev for the academic degree of the candidate of sciences and physics and mathematics, uh, specialization 010407, condensed metaphysics, is titled The Influence of Temperature and Oxygen on Graphene and Hexagonal um, Boron Nitride Monolayers Formed on Lattice Matched Metallic Substrates. The thesis was approved for the defense by the order of the academic secretary of uh, St. Petersburg State University issued on uh, December 17th, 2020, number 114-31-1. Mr. Shevelev 
has prepared his thesis at St. Petersburg State University, and a Professor Dmitry Usachov, Doctor of Sciences in Physics and Mathematics, Professor of the Solid State Electronics Department of St. Petersburg State University, is the thesis supervisor. So, uh, four published works describe the research findings. They include no papers published in peer-reviewed journals recommended by the Ministry of Education and Science of the Russian Federation. And there are four papers in publications indexed in Web of Science and Scopus. The candidate has submitted the full set of documents to the academic secretary. And uh, the above-mentioned documents comply with item 12, section 3 of the order on the procedure of granting academic degrees at St. Petersburg State University. As far as I'm informed, uh, all the documents submitted comply with the requirements and they are found in the certification file of the candidate for the degree and uh, the curator of the defense, the member of the Department of Dissertation Board Support has all the copies. And before I give the floor to our candidate for the degree, I want to ask the members of the board if there are any uh, questions, general questions to the candidate for the degree. Is there a need to consider the full list of documents submitted by the candidate for the degree? So no questions as far as I see. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, Victor, you have the floor. Hello. I can start my speech already. Do you hear me well? Yes, yes, we do. Okay. Hello, everyone, once again. My name is Victor Shevilov. The topic of my uh, thesis is the influence of temperature and oxygen on graphene and uh, hexagonal boron nitrate monolays formed on lattice matched metallic substrates. And first of all, I would like to say a few words about the objects of study. So graphene, we all know it quite well. That's a monolayer of carbon atoms that has a, a unique electron structure. Uh, um, and uh, the monolayer of hexagonal boron nitrate has a similar structure, but at the same time it is an insulator and an inert substance that does not interact with the majority of reagents and is not oxidized up until 170 degrees Celsius, and it, this is of particular importance. And talking about the practical applications of boron nitrite, we can mention that it's used in spin filters as a tunnel barrier between uh, graphene and ferromagnetic metal. The main goal of this work was to provide a comprehensive study of changes in the crystal and electronic structures of graphene and hexagonal boron nitride formed on single uh, crystal surfaces of metals with close uh, lattice parameters under the influence of uh, heat treatment and oxygen and uh, determined the possibilities of Raman spectroscopy as applied to the studied systems based on graphene. And in order to achieve these goals, we have resolved the following objectives. Uh, we wanted to study the effect of molecular oxygen on hexagonal boron nitride in case of strong interaction and I of inert substrates, then study the effect of molecular oxygen on single crystalline and polycrystalline graphene grown on cobalt substrate to determine the possibilities of Raman spectroscopy in order to analyze the crystal structure of the studied interfaces based on graphene to develop a method of recrystallization of graphene on the surface of cobalt, which allows to obtain single crystalline graphene, and also to study the kinetics of recrystallization and determine the possib possible mechanisms of this process. And now let's shift to the first part of our results. As the use of Raman spectroscopy in the majority of cases is associated with the contact of uh, samples with air, as in our case, we've carried out preliminary experiments on the definition of influence of this contact. And the results of these experiments are seen on this slide, are given on this slide. And the major conclusions that we can make is that monocrystalline graphene 
on cobalt and nickel uh, is not prone for this uh, oxygen impact and its initial state is easy to restore. Whereas polycrystalline graphene at room temperature during this contact with air is partially intercalated with oxygen and we see the emergence of C1 component, uh, you see it in green. And further heating in ultra-high vacuum aggravates the situation, and more than half of graphene is intercalated by uh, oxygen, and it shifts to free condition. Mm. And in order to visualize uh, the intercalation, we used photoelectron microscopy. And these pictures are given on, on the slide in the upper part. And what can we say? Intercalation happens quite heterogeneously. These uh, dark areas correspond to intercalated uh, graphene uh, that shifted to quasi-free state, and uh, the light areas are bound areas. And the intercalation factor is supported by the fact that the direct cone on after the impact of oxygen on the samples and further heating uh, restore near the Fermi level. That demonstrates that graphene shifts to quasi-free state. Now let's shift to Raman spectroscopy. Overall, mono, uh, single crystalline graphene a spectra demonstrated several peculiarities. First of all, there's absence of D and 2D bands in the spectra in any area, and G band is has shifted regarding its position in case of free graphene and this shift is associated with a, a strain of graphene due to this uh, lack of correspondence of uh, lattice um, constants of graphene and cobalt in polycrystalline graphene the spectra are measured along the um, line and they were heterogeneous as well and part of the spectra were resembled the spectra of uh, closely bound monocrystal graphene with a smaller shift of G-zone. And in other places, we observed the spectra that resembled the spectra of uh, free graphene. And uh, the first um, plots are associated with non-intercalated graphene, and the second spots are associated with intercalated um, areas. And from these results, uh, we're used to assess uh, the degree of strain of oriented and misoriented graphenes, and it made up 0.6% for rotated domains and 1.8% for oriented domains. And additional measurements using the diffraction method uh, supported these um, figures. Talking about the formation of G-zone in closely bound graphene, we can presume that G-band in a spectrum of monocrystalline graphene is formed due to non-resonance mechanism. So electron is excited not from 3D zone of metal, but from the state of graphene near the level of Fermi. In, near the so-called mini cone, and this excitation happens on uh, at the virtual state, and uh, this hollow has a large enough lifespan for sub subsequent Raman process to be successful. And based on these results, we um, compiled our first um, ideas. Uh, the graphene is synthesized on cobalt surface. Uh, and it is characterized by lattice strain reaching 0.6% for polycrystalline and 1.8% for single crystalline graphene. And the detected G-band in the Raman spectra of single crystalline graphene on cobalt substrate is due to non-resonant uh, scattering in contrast to the uh, resonant one. So let's shift to the next part of the results. Recrystallization of pure uh, graphene on cobalt. Let's start with pure graphene. On this slide, we see the evolution of C1S spectrum of graphene and the appropriate DMA images depending on the temperature of heating of graphene. And we see that initially polycrystalline graphene during heating at temperature 750 degrees 
is becoming monocrystal one and we see it by the characteristic split of C1 peak and abs nearly full absence of uh, curve-like reflexes. First of all, recrystallization was possible in a very narrow band of temperatures and at lower temperatures uh, it is not going and at high temperatures graphene uh, breaks down as you see in the last spectrum and it's impossible to achieve full crystallization nearly 10 percent of uh, graphene remained non-crystallized as in case with intercalation with oxygen we used photoelectron microscopy in order to visualize the process of recrystallization and we see uh, the difference quite well between recrystallized sample and the grown um, single crystalline sample. We see that in recrystallized sample we have a lot of uh, light areas associated with polycrystalline areas of non-recrystallized graphene. And we also uh, carried out recrystallization of B graphene. And it should be mentioned that in the recrystallized sample, the concentration of boron in the lattice of graphene remained um, not changed. And the asymmetry of uh, doping of different sublattices with boron uh, atoms was less pronounced than in case with a uh, uh, synthesized sample. And studying the kinetics was carried out using the classical uh, Johnson Mel Avrame Kolmogorov model. And in this equation, we were interested in two values. First of all, the n parameters responsible for the dimension of recrystallization. And the values that we got demonstrate that recrystallization of graphene on cobalt happens due to the migration of one dimensional boundaries of already existing two dimensional domains. And the calculated energy of activation of this process allowed us to provide uh, the appropriate mechanism of uh, this process. And based on this data, we uh, give the next two provisions brought for the defense. The developed method of recrystallization of gra graphene on cobalt uh, surface makes it possible to convert up to 90% of polycrystalline graphene into single crystalline one. The measured activation energy of recrystallization indicates that the mechanism of this phenomenon is associated with a significant decrease in the barrier for the separation of a carbon atom from graphene in the presence of a substrate. And upon recrystallization of boron doped polycrystalline graphene on cobalt surface, the boron impurity is retained in the graphene lattice. In this case, the difference in boron concentrations in the two carbon sublattices after recrystallization is less pronounced than in the synthesized single crystal doped graphene. So let's shift to the next topic the next part of our results, namely to the oxidation of uh, monolayer of hexagonal boron nitride on cobalt. So let's start with the interaction of uh, with cobalt uh, substrate. A long heating in oxygen demonstrated that during the oxidation of HBN on cobalt, we see the formation of two types of local active structures, BN2O and BO3 with, with atoms of oxygen surrounding boron. The formation of these structures happened due to the introduction of uh, oxygen atoms to the uh, HBN lattice with the substitution of uh, nitrogen atoms. And in order to confirm this idea, we carried out uh, calculation, uh, DFT calculations, and we calculated the chemical shifts that corresponded with the experimental peaks. So here is the mechanism of this process, and it is associated with the dissociation of molecular oxygen in the contact with catalytic uh, surface of cobalt with the formation of atomic oxygen that in turn uh, is capable to oxidize monolayers of boron nitride. And in order to confirm this hypothesis, we carried out appropriate DFT calculations on the absorption of oxygen molecules on the cobalt surface. And we see here that the relaxation of this calculation uh, oxygen molecule indeed is dissociated 
into atomic oxygen. And taking into account the increased heating temperature, uh, the probability of uh, this process is increasing. And in order to study oxidation of boron nitrate uh, on inert uh, substrate, we used uh, gold. Uh, and on this factory, you see the results, and we see that uh, the speed of oxidation has dropped significantly. And with the heating lasted for 500 minutes, unlike in the previous case. And at that, we saw the formation of just one type of local active structures, namely BN2O. And in order to explain why two other types are absent in this case, we carried out DFT calculations that demonstrated that boron atom bound with two or three atoms of oxygen is shifted from the layer of boron nitride, and this energy of connection is characteristic for a weak adsorption at increased temperatures. This atom can dissolve from the surface, and this may potentially explain the absence of these structures in spectra of peaks characteristic for these structures. And based upon these data, we give the next um, uh, idea during the oxidation of hexagonal boron nitrate and cobalt substrate. Oxygen atoms are introduced into the HBN lattice with the substitution of nitrogen atoms. In this case, two types of structures will the one and three oxygen atoms are formed in the nearest environment of boron, uh, BN2. Uh, and BO3. In case of a hexagonal boron nitrate intercalated with gold, the predominant formation of BN2O structures occurs while structures with two and three oxygen atom atoms surrounded by boron are unstable. And now let's shift to the last part of our uh, study. And this part is dedicated to oxygen intercalation of graphene on cobalt. Let's start with polycrystalline graphene on cobalt. And we see that the heating of the sample of polycrystalline graphene in oxygen atmosphere leads to a rather quick and homogeneous intercalation of oxygen under uh, polycrystalline graphene. And long term, heating leads to partial etching of graphene and the formation of carbonate groups. And we observe their presence in the spectra of absorp absorption. In case of monocrystalline, single crystalline graphene, intercalation happens slower. And we did not manage to achieve homogeneous um, intercalation. And at that, we observed a stronger etching of the sample, which in turn is seen not just by the general drop of uh, C1S uh, curve intensity, but also due to the high intensity of B peak that corresponds to carbonate groups. So once again, just to visualize the intercalation process, uh, you see the we carried out measurements using photoelectron microscopy, and we see it in upper pictures in polycrystalline graphene. The intercalation starts around these dark areas uh, that we see on the initially fresh uh, synthesized sample. And we associate these areas with uh, cobalt carbide um, areas, so the defects of a layer that open up access for oxygen under the layer of graphene. And further attempts to deintercalate these samples were not successful because there was a lot of oxygen that remained on the surface of the sample. And we believe it is associated with the oxidation of cobalt and the formation of um, volumetric zones of cobalt. And in single crystalline graphene, the intercalation was quite even across the surface. But on this picture, we see that there are a lot of uh, light areas that can uh, demonstrate uh, heterogeneity of microstructural level, what we observed in the spectra, uh, XPS spectra. Though the attempt to deintercalate this sample allowed us to uh, to 
nearly practically get back the sample to the initial state. And based on that, we have this uh, provision uh, brought for the defense, the last one. The rate and homogeneity of oxygen intercalation into graphene cobalt interface is determined not only by temperature and pressure, but also by the crystalline structure of interface and the presence of defects in graphene. And on this slide, once again, you see all the provisions brought for the defense. And that's basically it. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, distinguished members of the board, are there any general questions on the speech, on the presentation of our candidate for the degree? No questions. Okay. Okay. Maybe later. And in this case, we shift to a more detailed discussion of the work and um, to the speeches of the members of the board with their reviews. So the first one, the first me member of the board. Oh, pardon. Before I give the floor to the first uh, member of the board, I have the following question. Uh, what do we plan to do? Is Victor going to answer questions at once after they are asked? Or, Victor, is it more convenient to answer all the questions at, uh, after all the speeches? I believe uh, after each of the speeches, because otherwise he will mix up everything. He may forget questions. OK, OK. Then uh, Victor is going to answer questions right after each speech. OK. So, right now, we didn't get any external reviews. Maybe someone uh, made one. Uh, I have a question. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, please, Professor. Okay, may, may I ask the question now? Okay, I'm starting. So, I have a question to slide number six. And in the slide number six, you show you show uh, the the frequencies of the G band and the versus the frequencies of the two D band. And uh, you then have shown a, a, a straight line that uh, is a fit to the slope. And you say from this um, line fit, you can extract the strain of your two D layer. If I understood correctly, and my question to you is, what is the what is the basis, uh, physical basis for extracting the strain uh, from this plot? Так, основание для растяжения. Вопрос заключается в том, что. So as far as I understood, the question is that we. Just take out the 2D plot uh, of the zone. Is it? Oh. Or did I? Uh, or did I uh, miss the question? Could you please repeat the question, Professor? Yes. So the question is, um, what is the basis, the physical basis, of extracting the strain? From the from the from the ratio of the frequencies, yeah. So you have the frequency of G band and the frequency of the 2D band at different positions, yeah. And I would like to know how can I extract the strain of the whole sample from such a plot? Ah, yeah, oh, yeah, Okay, I got it. Got the question. Thank you. So this shift of G band. regarding its position in case of free graphene is mostly associated with the strain of graphene and we have a shift roughly 100 uh, reverse centimeters and we know that 1% of strain corresponds to 60 uh, of such centimeters. And thus, we can assess in case of monocrystalline graphene that the strain of this layer makes up 
1.8 percent. And this strain, uh, this is the value, um, like the value of difference of uh, lattice constants of graphene and cobalt. So we roughly coordinate this shift of this line. And the initially known difference in the lattice constants. Uh, did it make sense, <laughs> Professor? Yeah, thank you. It's okay. Это Александр Гринайс. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Now uh, I'm going to give the floor to the members uh, of the board for their reviews. As all the reviews were already published on the St. Petersburg State University website, I offer the following thing. I offer all the members of the board to give just general ideas, the basic points of your uh, reviews, maybe comments or questions. Uh, do you support this idea, this proposal? OK, OK. Now let's shift to the speeches of our members of the board. And I will give the floor to Professor Filatova, uh, first of all. So please, Professor. Well, I'll just provide a general characteristic to the work because I'm the first speaker among my colleagues. So the thesis is dedicated to the study of parameters of local and electron structures of um, graphene and uh, hexagonal boron nitrates on in cobalt and nickel uh, under the impact of temperature and oxygen with the use of methods based on the sources of synchrotron radiation. The work is a finished study during which the methodologies of data analysis uh, were uh, used, including photoelectron spectro spectroscopy, um, uh, X-ray spectroscopy of absorption angles, the diffraction of um, uh, slow electrons. Uh, so all these methods uh, are also used along with uh, combination scattering, and they, uh, all of these methods were used to achieve the goal to establish the physical regularities um, in the formation of uh, the structures between pure and uh, doped uh, graphene and um, hexagonal boron nitride in order to improve the quality of graphene. So I'll skip some of the points, and I would like to dwell upon the basics, the basic points of my review. It should be mentioned that the content of the study, if we judge by the third and the fourth chapter, correspond with the passport of specialization for uh, condensed metaphysics. And as for the relevance of the topic, the relevance of uh, the topic is defined uh, by the cho chosen objects of study and by the use of state-of-the-art diagnostics methods. Uh, and the author also using different installations. The unique graphene characteristics opened up broad opportunities for its application in the creation of new electron devices, electronic devices. And this emphasizes the importance of thesis, not only from the point of view of fundamental physics, but also from the point of view of applied uh, physics. And uh, graphene characteristics are dependent on its uh, structural, on, uh, on its structure and electronic structure as well, which is dependent on a range of factors in turn. And it should be emphasized that in the thesis we have quite a logical chain of uh, study uh, aimed at the improvement of the quality of graphene synthesized on metallic substrates, cobalt and nickel. And most interesting results as far as I am concerned, are uh, as follows. The two major provisions. Um, 
The work demonstrates not just the opportunity but also the efficiency of using spectroscopy of combination light scattering in the study of a graphene interface. Uh, of the interface graphene and strongly interacting metal substrates. This provides quick characterization of graphene on metallic substrates that does not require super ultra high vacuum. And second, it is demonstrated that using recrystallization process, major part of polycrystalline graphene can be turned into monocrystalline layer that has a better structure. And this opens up opportunities to produce a high quality graphene. As for the scientific novelty, it is defined by the fact that the results of experimental studies uh, were received for the first time. As for the validity and credibility of the results and conclusions, it, they are defined by the application of contemporary approaches and they are provided by the correct target setting of the work. For scientific provisions and conclusions formulated in the thesis, uh, we see that there is lack of contradiction and the conclusions are well grounded and these define scientific novelty and the importance of the results, uh, scientific provisions and conclusions formulated in, by the author. And the results are important both fundamentally and practically. And unlike this, um, so still I have several comments. First comment, analyzing the structure of interfaces in systems graphene nickel and graphene cobalt after short-term annealing. The author uh, mentions the heterogeneity of interface in the system graphene nickel based on the analysis of the form and width of photoelectron lines, uh, 1S lines and spectrum of combination scattering. Yes, indeed, in case of graphene cobalt, we observe a broad band that is compiled of two components, uh, these two sublattices of graphene. And for system graphene nickel, we observe rather narrow line, and we don't see the split in this case. And when we analyze uh, the spectrum, um, the Raman spectrum, we see the vice versa dependency f uh, wide line for graphene on nickel and narrow line for graphene on cobalt. How can we associate it with experimental observations? So you need to explain that. Second question. Uh, the evolution of carbon 1S line is unclear in the spectrum of graphene cobalt during the change of temperature. Uh, analyzing the pink form, we can presume that the components that are uh, of two sublattices either un get united in one at 620 degrees Celsius or just um, are divided with a rise of temperature and maximum division is observed at 780 degrees Celsius. So it's unclear how this shift uh, happens after synthesis, after the annealing at 420 degrees. So what is the connection with image 3.6? So there's a kind of uh, gap over here. Third point, it's unclear how you explain the emergence of new components in boron and a nitrogen spectrum uh, under the impact of oxygen on the interface of um, HBN on cobalt. Based on the analysis of uh, boron spectrum, it, I presume that there's an introduction of oxygen atom into the lattice of hexagonal boron nitride with a substitute of nitrogen atoms and the formation of local oxide groups, BN2O, um, which is quite uh, probable. But when we shift to nitrogen uh, spectrum, the author using DFT calculations says that the emergence of new components is associated with heterogeneity of intercalation of oxygen. And what about the formation of BN2O that we see in boron spectrum? Fourth point. Unfortunately, you don't describe the equipment. Uh, you provide no details on uh, uh, the measurements. and. Uh, the fifth point is that there are certain misprints and there's a low quality of images that you've taken from other works. Still, these uh, remarks do not compromise the overall high, uh, overall good impression of the, on the thesis. They're just private comments and they can't influence the um, 
the assessment of this uh, thesis. The results were already published in four articles, as it was already mentioned, and I believe that the thesis by Victor Shevelev is a finished study aimed at the studying of physical regularities of the formation of structures and interfaces between uh, pure and uh, doped graphene and hexagonal boron nitrate and uh, metallic substrates in order to improve the quality of graphene and it demonstrates the high qualification of the author and the thesis uh, gives a broad range of novel results and it managed to resolve to the um, all the goals that it had therefore i believe that the thesis by victor shivelov titled influence of temperature and oxygen on graphene and hbn monolays formed on lattice merged metallic substrates meets the requirements of the order as of September the 1st, 2016, on the procedure of granting academic degrees at St. Petersburg State University. And I believe that Mr. Shivelov deserves the academic degree of the candidate of sciences in physics and mathematics in specialization series 10407, condensed matter physics, and article 11 of the above mentioned order is not violated. So that's it, what I wanted to say. Alexander, Alexander microphone. Yes, Alexander Stepanovich. Yes, yes, colleagues, thank you. <coughs> so, Victor, please, I give you the floor to answer the questions. Thank you. Well, start, well, let's start by the order, question one. As for the width and the form of lines in XPS and in Raman spectrum, the spectroscopy, photoelectron spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy measure different characteristics of the sample. So the width of the line in XPX spectra is dependent on uh, on the deformation range uh, and in Raman's uh, so they are dependent on um, the energies of the connections of 1s uh, level so if we're talking about the broad line in case of graphene nickel in Raman spectrum this demonstrates that there is um, certain heterogeneity from the structural point of view. So it's not correct to draw some similarities between XPS and Raman. That's for the first question. As for the second question, as for the components in um, uh, different spectra. Indeed, this was the first um, idea when we saw those components and we, and carried out DFT calculations of the chemical shifts for N1S levels. And these calculations demonstrated that there is practically no shift. The atoms of nitrogen that are found in the close surrounding of this oxide structure, uh, their position of N1S peak uh, undergoes no chemical shift. Therefore, we presumed that the main reason is in the heterogeneity of intercalation. Though I agree that these results that we provide in the thesis, uh, they are not enough in order to say that for sure, uh, to mention the nature of these peaks for sure. Therefore, we just presume, make an assumption here. Next question on the evolution of C1S spectrum. Well, when we talk about synthesized and uh, mm, synthesized sample and annealed sample, we are referring to the central spectrum that was that initially corresponded to this grown sample, monocrystal sample, and 
quite logically, we observe this split of uh, C1S level. And when we talk about recrystallization, we talk about unreversible poly uh, crystallization of polycrystalline graphene. 620 degrees, that's polycrystalline graphene that did not start to recrystallize because the recrystallization happens in a very narrow temperature range. And as soon as we heat it up until the necessary temperature, 750 degrees Celsius, we see the emergence of characteristic uh, a split for monocrystalline graphene. Therefore, we have no transformations. Um, so it was monocrystalline, then polycrystalline, then once again monocrystalline. We don't have that. Uh, and as for the last two comments, here I just can agree. Maybe I could have described the <coughs> equipment in more detail as well as other uh, conditions for experiments. And as for misprints, that's quite the same. I just agree with them. OK, 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 that's it. Yelena, are you satisfied? Yes, we can have a certain discussion, but I would like to comment that in fact, the combination scattering spectrum and photoelectron spectrum, they, they do not exclude each other from the point of view of uh, information acquisition. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that when we talk about the emergence of oxygen atoms in boron spectra, uh, they should emerge in ni uh, nitrogen spectra as well, regardless of the calculations that you carried out. So here, you should not be based just on calculations. So you held this experiment, you got calculations, and that's it. You should establish the general chain, interdependent chain. So we can discuss it. But overall, I'm satisfied with your answers, yes. So overall, you're satisfied with answers. Yes, but we could, we could discuss them. Yes, we could discuss them forever, certainly. Uh, OK, then uh, Professor Pavlichev. Um, so you're, you're the next. Yes, thank you very much for the, uh, giving me the floor. I'll try to be very short. Uh, so you hear me, do you? So this study, as far as I'm concerned, is quite relevant. It gives us important, important results from the point of view of fundamental and applied uh, studies. And uh, the thesis resolves of the general question, independent problem. And as a positive point, I would like to mention uh, this combination of photoelectron spectroscopy, absorption spectroscopy, a diffraction of sm slow electrons. So that's uh, this combination of methods that is quite um, standard for the analysis of such systems. And this combination of these uh, X-ray electron methods with combination scattering spectroscopy, I believe that's quite relevant, a quite relevant choice and quite a promising field as well. And if in uh, X-ray electron methods all the intensities of uh, tra uh, transformations are associated with matrix elements, of a dipole operator of electromagnetic radiation, then in this combination, we see the polarization of our system. These are matrix elements. And the operator here is a polarized system. And uh, the analysis of results is quite a promising field, I believe. And it adds up to other fields if we talk about the studying of electron atomic structure of a hard body. And in especially if we talk about such graphene-like systems. And I've made four comments. I won't read them all out. Uh, I just like to dwell upon one, one comment. On image uh, 3.7 in chapter 3, you have boron 1s uh, photoelectron spectrum, and the line is divided into two components. And the intensity of these components, you know, they oscillate. And on this um, image 3.7, you give this oscillating curve. 
that you obtained during this breakdown. And here you should take into account the fact that this breakdown can be approximated because the use of fold of one Lawrence and one Gauss is not enough for um, a specific description because the line does not take into account the spread of electron density of photoelectrons. They are described as flat waves. And in this case, uh, such oscillations can be just the result of a certain approximation of um, this expansion. And on the other hand, we could see uh, the uh, Fourier image of such oscillations. So the question is, how do you explain these oscillations? And did you uh, perform this Fourier uh, expansion? That's an important uh, point that I wanted to mention. And in conclusion, after reading the entire text, I believe that it uh, makes up a very good impression overall, and the author uh, resolves the sad problems, and an important problem of uh, material science is also uh, resolved, and you also obtained very good results that improve the understanding of the formation of electronic atomic structure of graphene and graphene-like systems. And uh, the results open up new prospects for further use. If we talk about applied problems of contemporary material science, and overall, I believe that the thesis by Victor Shevelev. So I won't read the, uh, this title of the thesis, but overall, I believe that the thesis meets the requirements of um, the order on the procedure of granting academic degrees at Saint Petersburg State University. And I believe that Mr. Shevelev deserves an academic degree of the candidate of sciences in physics and mathematics in specialization 010407, condensed matter physics. And Article 11 of the above mentioned order is not violated. That's it, what I wanted to say. That's my review for this thesis. Thank you. Thank you, Andrei. Victor, so please, I give you the floor for the answer. Okay. As for this um, expansion, photoelectron diffraction is a well-known and powerful method for the analysis of the crystalline structure. and. So I don't give the data of the spectrum here, but the fact that uh, that's not a feature of expansion, but a real effect, it is not questioned because even if we uh, give um, the appropriate graphene spectra, for example, in case of non-doped graphene, we see the breakdown, and we see the intensities of this spectra. Uh, it is changing depending on the energy of photons at which we measure this spectra. And as for Fourier, it is used mostly in cases when we measure uh, two-dimensional diffraction images. And in this case, we measured a set of spectra and used expansion to uh, assess the change of intensities of these components. And then we carried out the theoretical uh, processing that allowed us to correspond this type of diffraction dependency on a uh, to a specific structure. And this is also observed in case of uh, uh, boron doped graphene and in case of pure graphene and in a number of other structures that were measured later on, um, not uh, as part of this thesis. So we just continue the use of this data in our lab. Uh, 
Okay, Victor, is that all? Yes, yes, Andre, are you satisfied with the answer? Well, you believe that these oscillations of components are the result of diffraction of photoelectrons on the nearest proximity or on the crystalline structure? That's the question that I wanted to specify. What is this mechanism? Uh, how should I associate that with the entire lattice or with this uh, um, uh, neighboring uh, area? Using diffraction, we can define the structure of how graphene is lying regarding cobalt. For example, the provision of uh, carbon atoms on top hollow, top bridge, and so on. We see the differences between different configurations. So if I would uh, make this Fourier imaging of this oscillating picture, I would get this distance from boron to metal. Yes? Yes. Depending on the position of boron. Yes? In this lattice. Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you. I got the answer. OK. OK, that's clear. Thank you, Andre. Now I would like to give the floor to Professor Katrub. Please, Professor. So, distinguished colleagues, the thesis is uh, a very interesting one. It is a large work, and that's really a good study of the graphene materials. And it seems to me, well, graphene is very actively studied um, in the recent years, but still the author found certain uh, novelty and certain originality to obtain uh, brand new ideas on the opportunities of synthesis of graphene on metallic substrates and on the chemical reaction capacity of these substrates. As far as I'm concerned, he resolved three problems that were systematically described in the thesis. First of all, the study of the impact of interaction of the received structure of graphene with oxygen, the formation of o o oxide layers, the interaction with oxidized uh, substrates as well. And also the study of recrystallization uh, was very interesting, certainly that it has a practical value. And third, uh, the study of the opportunity to use the combination scattering of light to study graphene on substrates. So these are methodological combinations of uh, different methods in order to interpret the results. And this all is described quite well and quite clearly. And I don't have any doubts that the thesis was quite a good one. But still, reading this work, I had certain questions and remarks. Um, yes, remarks, mainly associated with the fact that the thesis was uh, written quite quickly, and the author was not very attentive to the reading of the text, and he has certain um, misprints and problems that I detected. First. You don't describe in your work at what temperatures and what are the precursors that you use to synthesize graphene. So you don't even mention how you got this material that you studied. Second point, the author is actively using this term of hybridization of uh, carbon atoms. But traditionally, this term is used to describe covalent um, um, carbon um, compounds. So you don't give a direct description of what is this chemical interaction of graphene and boron nitride. So what is kind of um, bound is there, covalent or not? So you're just hiding behind this term of hybridization, and it becomes unclear what actually happens there. Third point, I believe it's not correct to, uh, to call this G-band uh, in a Raman spectrum as a breathing mode. And in the start of the thesis, you mentioned that the intensity of optic signal depends on the width of uh, oxide film. And then you give, give uh, 
uh, you say that there are uh, hundreds of times changes and finally give a diagram 1.6 uh, where you mentioned that maximum mm, maximum difference is 30 in this int intensity due to interference fifth question the author for some reason does not give and consider Raman spectra of beta of graphene so that's the problem in systematization of the thesis. If you describe all the materials, XPS and Raman, so why don't you give it here? It's unclear. Six point interpretation of XPS graphene spectra synthesized on cobalt is rather ambiguous. C1S spectrum of graphene after the exposition in air changes. There is a shift of line and there is an additional C1 line. Um, and that is associated with carbon containing adsorbents and I work in a chemical institute and it's unclear for me what do you mean by uh, carbon containing adsorbents maybe it's associated with your understanding of how this line behaves depending on the temperature of um, annealing but you still should have a certain chemical identification what do you observe here uh, what is this intensive uh, carbon line on the surface and some question, and that's just uh, a mismatch in the description of spectra of oxygen in image 3.1. In the text, you talk about two lines uh, defined OA and OB, but in the image, you, um, you name them OS and ON. Certainly, I may have missed it, but still, I mentioned that. However, these drawbacks uh, do not compromise the good impression of the results. And uh, the author also published four articles in high-ranking journals. And uh, Mr. Shvilov took part in uh, several international conferences as well. And overall, I believe that the thesis by Viktor Shvilov, titled Influence of Temperature and Oxygen on Graphene and HBN Monolays, formed on lattice meshed metallic substrates, meets the requirements of, of the order on the procedure of granting academic degrees at St. Petersburg State University. And uh, Mr. Shivilov, as far as I'm concerned, uh, deserves the academic degree of the candidate of sciences in physics and mathematics in specialization 010407, condensed matter physics. And Article 11 of the above mentioned order is not violated. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Okay, Victor, please answer the questions. Okay. Yes, thank you very much for the questions. A really very good questions. As for the first question, indeed, I have to agree I missed this temperature of synthesis of pure graphene. Griffin was synthesized at 600 degrees Celsius. And at that, the conditions, yes, and by the way, as for precursor, and the precursor for uh, this pure graphene was propylene. And judging by the conditions of synthesis, and um, as for the precursors of other systems, we gave this description in uh, sample synthesis division in chapter experimental methods and equipment. Maybe it was not um, very detailed. Yes, that's that is my mistake in this case. As for this term hybridization of um, carbon atoms, I agree with that as well. Maybe that is a kind of jargonism for this uh, field. And here I referred to strong bond between graphene and metallic substrates as a result of partial mixing of electron states of graphene and cobalt and nickel in this case. And as for the next question, as for this incorrect term of breathing mode, well, in fact, the problem is not in that. The problem was in the English version of the thesis, and I had a misprint there. I missed this D uh, letter. 
and this breathing mode in the thesis was um, referring to D band. And this term was taken from an appropriate article of Review Ferrari in which regarding D band of graphene and then ascension of um, expansion and compression, they used this term, a breathing mode. So that's uh, a word by word translation here. Then the intensity of the optic signal, what was mentioned. Indeed, in the start of the thesis, I mentioned that um, uh, hundreds of times, um, and it was quite incorrect. Yes, I corrected it uh, in many uh, places of the thesis, but I forgot to correct it there. As for um, Raman spectrum of the doped graphene, why don't I, didn't I measure them? Boring graphene is oxidized quite quickly in air, so its characteristics change quite significantly uh, under the influence of atmosphere. Therefore, uh, non-vacuum measurements won't be enough, and the results would be not um, exemplary, you know. And as for vacuum tests, unfortunately, we did not carry them out. As for the next idea of lack of correspondence of um, Nomination, yes, I beg your pardon for that. I just uh, replaced images, and therefore the description of one image uh, remained there with the new image. And I've taken the new image from an article that was published not long before. Uh, not long before the publication of my thesis, so this was a mistake here. And as for this sea line question, this line, as it was mentioned in the thesis, it is dealing not to carbon containing adsorbents, but to graphene intercalated with oxygen. And I certainly reread what I was written, uh, what I what I wrote in the thesis, and there, the text is written so that. One may have this false impression that this line is associate is uh, connected with carbon um, containing adsorbents, but all the lines that we associate with adsorbents are given in yellow, and this C line is defined as the line of peak cord associated with intercalated um, uh, substance. And the detailed study of what is being absorbed from the atmosphere was not carried out because we did not focus on this question. Maybe we should introduce some additional measurements to identify this peak. That's it. Thank you. OK. I still have a question left. Yes, o on the interpretation of C1 peak. So you associate it with the presence of oxygen, yes. So that's carbon that interacts with oxygen uh, adsorbed on the, on the substrate. Because the presence of oxygen usually leads to the shift of high energies of connection of a bond. And here we see a shift to the drop of this energy of bond. Can you explain this? Yes, I'll give it a try. This C0 peak is associated with strongly bound graphene with substrate. When there is an intercalation of oxygen under graphene, under the impact of atmosphere, graphene partially inter is intercalated with oxygen, and oxygen penetrates under the layer of graphene and disrupts this uh, strong bond between graphene and cobalt. And as a result, we see this shift to the smaller energy uh, bonding. And the same was observed in ARPES uh, data when direct cone restores near the Fermi level. So that's a clear uh, defini definition that graphene during intercalation uh, shifts to quasi-free state and 
there is a certain um, doping of uh, graphene during this intercalation. So I believe it's quite okay with this shift of uh, direction. So, Alexander, are you satisfied with the answer? Yes. Yes, I am. Okay. Now I would like to give the floor to our Professor Grunois. Please, Professor, your review. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay. So I can maybe uh, be very quick in the interest of time, but uh, I would first like to say a few things on the thesis, and then I have a number of questions uh, I wrote down. So, first of all, um, I've studied the thesis in detail, and and um, to me, what I found uh, that the main novel thing, especially in the chapter three, is that the candidate has used uh, the first time actually um, Raman spectroscopy for the characterization of epitaxial graphene. So, I, I consider this actually as a quite a pioneering work, and this has uh, surely stimulated further work. So, this is a very nice uh, result, in my opinion. Um, it has also stimulated, for example, work in my group. Yeah? So we actually run a UHB uh, Raman spectrometer, and, and uh, we, we, we have been very interested in, in, in reading the, the, the papers by, by, by Dr. V uh, Victor Shevilov. So I think this is a, a very good result, what he had. And um, what he uh, used it for um, is essentially to, to, to analyze the strain. So um, he has shown where people have known this, but he has shown it via Raman that uh, uh, this epitaxial graphene on cobalt is, is heavily strained, and you get this in the order of 1% strain. And this results in a, in, a, in, a in a very large, in an extremely large shift, actually, of the G-band. So that the G-band is generally shifted. People discuss uh, six shifts of, of, a, of a few wave numbers, but uh, because of this large strain, he observed the shift of uh, in the order of 100 wave numbers. Then what uh, uh, he found, in the, in the, also in the chapter number three, um, is that in the case of uh, monocrystalline uh, graphene on cobalt, uh, he, when he takes it, uh, well, he, he, well, one point is he always measures these samples in air. So he sees a G band, but as far as I understood, he does not see a, a 2D band and he does not see a, a D band. So the D band, uh, one might argue this is because of the, of the lack of, of defects. And for the absence of the 2D band, um, he has developed a model. Yeah? And um, this model uh, relies on the, on the band structure. And essentially, it claims that this double resonant uh, Raman process is not, is not possible uh, in, in, in the case of, in the case of uh, this, this um, heavily, strongly interacting graphene. Yeah? But when he has uh, polycrystalline graphene, he actually found both 2D band and, and, and D band. And essentially, all this uh, uh, Raman work is nicely in line um, with the with the works by by uh, Lead and by XPS that he has also shown. So, in that sense, maybe one interesting question would be to ask, or in his in his uh, model, would you expect uh, the G band to be present if you had not taken out the the sample to air? Is this a result of of some interaction with air, or is it just uh, a feature of, of your of your of your system. So that's that's one question. Uh, that's regarding to uh, to chapter number three. So then I, I go down uh, the thesis and um, what what he then also does. What, what I find interesting is um, he he studies this uh, recrystallization, and so he starts with a polycrystalline graphene and then he essentially um, heats it. And what he does is he um, he heats it and he, he looks at the, uh, at the intensity of the diffraction spots uh, due to the disoriented domains, and he records this intensity of the diffraction spots as a function of annealing time, and he gets a quite a good fit with the uh, uh, kolmogorov johnson johnson Mill and Avrami model, um, and he, he has some fit parameters there that probably depend on the dimensionality and that depend on the activation energy that I have also some questions for. But uh, one very nice application of this of this um, annealing procedure and making uh, graphene monocrystalline could be or would have been um, to actually transfer these graphene layers and to uh, study their mobility, because as you um, eliminate uh, grain boundaries, you would expect 
that your electronic mobility uh, goes up. Yeah. So and and people have shown it's possible to um, to make uh, uh, devices made out of graphene, which have electronic mobilities uh, uh, in the order of a few hundred thousand centimeters square per volt second. Uh, so, so I would uh, suggest, or uh, maybe it's, it's also a question to the candidate: Is is there any are there any plans, or did he try, did he attempt to to measure the the electronic mobility? Of course, uh, it's clear that you cannot do this on the same uh, crystal that you use for the synthesis, but you would have to transfer it. But this transfer from metal crystal usually works quite well, and I see no reason why this should not be done. Yeah? Good. Um, yeah, and uh, this this was this was the, the point regarding the graphene. Um, and I think yeah, so it would have been nice to to, to transfer graphene and, and to to look to the to the, to the, to the transport uh, properties of this system. Yeah, and in the in the last chapter of the work. Um, so oh, before I go to the last chapter of the work, I have another question actually on this uh, Johnson Kolmogorov mean Avrami model, and uh, that is also referring a bit to the talk what he did. So he showed this formula which, rela which relates, which he fitted with the diffraction spot intensity. And my question is, and then he concluded actually that um, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the mechanism by which you, 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 um, you um, form a very nice single crystalline graphene layer is the movement of these one dimensional domains. And my question is, I mean, what is the basis of of the model? How how can he extract this? Is this the fit parameter n? Is it the dimensionality? And and what is the what is the uh, the this? Maybe he can explain a bit this model. This this this. What is the basis for for all these fits? And uh, what is the parameter k, for example, in this model? Yeah. So essentially, he he I think he extracts some kind of activation energy. But it would be interesting for me how this activate where this activation energy is contained in the formula. Good. Now I, I go to the last chapter. So in chapter four, essentially, uh, uh, he, he started the, the interaction of uh, <clears throat> of graphene and HPN with oxygen. And what he did essentially is he made a new material, which which is which is uh, uh, oxidized uh, 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 BN structures. And um, so for that, he has shown a lot of XPS. But uh, my question would be, is it possible to see, for example, Raman there? Or did he see any Raman in the BN compound? And did he manage to, to see Arpes of such a uh, BN oxide compound? And what would be the, the, the predicted part, the predicted electronic properties? Yeah, so this is the question regarding the chapter four. And uh, so in conclusion, what I, what I found after reading the thesis and after um, um, listening to the talk, uh, is for, for me this is this is this two main things. So one he has really introduced the the, the method of Raman spectroscopy for epitaxial two uh, D layers. People have not considered this because the intensities are very small. But uh, one nice result of this thesis was for sure that uh, he has shown that despite the the the, the uh, Raman intensities they are rather small, one can extract very useful uh, uh, information. Uh, re regarding the the, the the vibrational properties of the 2D layer, and the second nice, uh, very nice result for me was this recrystallization uh, attempt, and uh, it would be especially nice if this would uh, would be continued, let's say, uh, with the with the, gay, with the with the goal of making uh, very high mobility uh, graphene devices, because if you think about the the, the overall uh, field there, yeah, so uh, the graphene mobilities are. That have the best abilities that have been achieved. They are very high. They are the one of um, 100,000 centimeters square per volt second. But still, there are other materials, especially gallium arsenide or so, where the mobilities are even much larger. So it would be interesting whether we can uh, uh, use this attempt, use this method to, to attempt very high mobilities. Yeah, and with this, uh, I would like to conclude. So I think this, all, all, all in all, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a very uh, interesting work and it surely deserves. Uh, uh, the the uh, the candidates to be awarded the, the PhD degree. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Grunice. Victor, do you have answers? Yes, yes, I'll give it a try. 
uh, if I got them and remember them correctly. So as for the presence of G-band in the spectra, that's not associated with oxygen. The more so, the discussion was on why does it actually exist in case of bound graphene, because D and 2D bands, as we know, they are associated with resonance processes, and G band can form as a result of non-resonance process. And here is of particular importance uh, to see this presence of mini cone uh, of graphene states near the Fermi levels. Uh, where we can see this transition of electron. And it's of particular importance that this mini cone is found in the band gap of metal, in the local band gap. So it has nothing to do with uh, air. Then as for recrystallization and the transfer of graphene, we tried to transfer graphene from our crystals, yet there were certain problems. How, well, first of all, let's uh, discuss this transfer. General transfer of graphene is uh, carried out with bubbling, with this bubbling method, so-called bubbling method, uh, from uh, copper uh, files through this uh, dissolution of a uh, substrate. And in our case, we have graphene grown on a thin uh, layer of cobalt that we have on uh, the massive uh, tungsten crystal. And in this case, it was hard to eliminate the substrate. And uh, the uh, tungsten monocrystal suffered from these attempts of transfer. Therefore, we gave it a try several times. And we had certain results, but quite insignificant, and we decided not to, exper uh, to continue our experiments because after several attempts, tungsten required polishing and other actions. Then, as for the equation, I cannot right now remember what was this value of uh, K, but as I what I have here on this image is an approximation of the experimental data, of the experimental curves using this equation. So for different samples of graphene, we used different uh, tungsten crystals. Some were massive, some were smaller. And we carried out measurements. Using this model, we approximated every, our data. Therefore, our n coefficient is in a certain uh, range from 1 to 1.4. And as for k coefficient, unfortunately, I can't give you the specific values that we got. Uh, is that it? Uh, well, if I did not miss anything, then it is. Uh, so, Professor Grunes, are you satisfied with the answers? Yeah, I mean, just I would like to ask you one more thing. So, you say the G band uh, would be there independent of the exposure of the crystal to air, just to, to get it right. Uh, could you please repeat the question, yeah. Professor, once again? I beg your pardon. So the G band uh, that you observed is there independent of whether or not you expose the crystal to air. So if you would measure this crystal, the graphene and cobalt, in vacuum, you would also see a G band. Uh, yes, uh, we are going to see it. Uh, we're going to see it, but possibly there will be certain impact on the presence of atmosphere um, or the position. Maybe there will be some impact on the position, but as for its existence, it is not dependent on the presence of atmosphere or on its absence during the measurements. But did you check this? Uh, uh, no, we presume that's a uh, presumption. That's an assumption. Okay, thank you.
so uh, okay okay if Professor Grunois is satisfied with the answers, then we can shift to the next um, article in our agenda. Uh, my review comes next. Yes. So I won't dwell upon the benefits of this work in detail because colleagues have already mentioned that. I would just like to ask questions. Certainly, I had much more of them, yet I've chosen the following ones. The first thing, many studies in the thesis are carried out for graphene and uh, HBN synthesized on the surface of hexagonal cobalt. And along with that, we well know that cobalt exists in two phases, alpha cobalt hexagonal one and beta cobalt cubic one. Uh, as uh, with alphabet uh, phase transition at a temperature of 445 degrees Celsius. And this polymorph transition ha happens rather slowly with a significant temperature hysteresis that is dependent on the speed of uh, heating and cooling. Yet in the work, we see nothing about this phase transition, and you do not explain why this transition does not influence the experimental results, regardless of the fact that the growth of um, cobalt substrates uh, graphene synthesis, HBN uh, synthesis, and their further thermal processing is carried out at temperatures higher than 445 degrees Celsius. That's the first point. Second point, we know that the optics of the majority of extraction channels and, and monochromatization of um, is um, polluted by carbon, and this explains strong modulation of intensity of monochromatic uh, C uh, beam in the area of C1S um, absorption margin. And this complicates um, uh, the non distorted uh, spectrum acquisition for graphene if we use the method of registry of full electron yield. Uh, th which complicate the situation due to low contrast of um, this mono monolayer spectrum. And you don't uh, t talk about the consideration of this complicated type of spectrum, so how you normalize this uh, C1S spectrum. Third point, in literature review on page um, 12, when describing the crystalline structure of graphene, you say, this type of structure is defined by S, um, P to hybridization of atomic orbits, and two uh, um, orbits are associated with the formation of sigma bonds, and uh, the remaining orbital participates in P bond formation. And that's an incorrect expression because we see three equivalent hybrid sigma orbits formation that provide for triangular coordination of carbon atoms in graphene. And P is achieved due to the fourth, uh, fourth one, to PZ. Uh, then, formula um, 2.4 is uh, given incorrectly, but you see it from the dimension in the upper part. You see the difference of energies of photoelectron and vacuum level. And regardless of the fact that this work is oriented to the study of uh, monolays of graphene and HBN on metallic uh, surfaces, uh, we did not manage to find uh, this uh, structural constants for cobalt, nickel, graphene, B graphene, and HBN. Uh, the author is limited with giving the values of uh, this coordination of structural parameters, for example, on page 13. Uh, the um, graphene and HBN uh, lattice uh, constants are different by 2% with a reference to stage 10. And they will have just the same phrase there. F sixth point. Uh, there are certain terminological and technical um, problems, but colleagues already mentioned that. Uh, so uh, this um, crystal with uh, curved surface. You see just curved crystal in Russian. Then uh, bands of combination scattering in Russian. You call them zones. That's not correct. We usually call them bands. Uh, 
And on page, uh, on image 3.1, page 14, for graphing on different substrates, you mentioned synthesis in UVV in Russian, whereas everywhere in the text you have synthesis in SVV, ultra-high vacuum and super-high vacuum. So uh, the difference in Russian words here. But you need to guess here. Uh, then on page um, 68, photoelectron B1S and N1S spectra in boron nitrate panels A and B are given on energy scale, energy of photons instead of energy of bond. And finally, page 74, in the increase of temperature, the oxygen molecule can dissociate. So that's a grammar mistake here. And on page 78, you write, I don't remember what was there. So it corresponds with to the carbon, carbon phase. What kind of phase is that? What is this carbon phase of carbon? And other misprints. However, these comments do not um, do not compromise the overall very high um, estimate of this work. And uh, the thesis by Victor Shevelev, titled Influence of Temperature and Oxygen on Graphene and HBN Monoly is formed on lattice meshed metallic substrates, is a finished scientific work that provides solutions to relevant problems of um, condensed matter physics and material science. It provides a comprehensive study of the changes of crystalline and electron structure of graphene and boron nitride formed on monocrystal uh, substrates under the impact of uh, temperature and oxygen. And the basic results were already published in high-ranking journals in nanoscale, ACS, nano, nanotechnology, general physical chemistry, and in two articles, Mr. Shevelev is the first author. So the conclusion is that the thesis by Victor Shevelev titled The Influence of Temperature and Oxygen on Graphene and HBN Monolase Formed on Lattice Meshed Metallic Substrates meets the requirements of the order as of September the 1st, 2016 on the procedure of granting academic degrees at St. Petersburg State University. And uh, Mr. Shevelev, as I believe, deserves the academic degree of the candidate of sciences in physics and mathematics in specialization 010407 condensed matter physics. And uh, I should also mention that Article 11 of the above mentioned order is not violated. And my signature over there. That's it. So, Victor, do you have anything to add up to my comments? Yes? Yes, I do. Okay, as for the first question on two uh, cobalt phases, indeed, there is this transition, yet the structure of the surface in these two phases is um, sa the same. The packaging of layers changes. In this phase transition on the surface, nothing changes, and as a result, there is no impact on the synthesized material. So there is no influence here. So we have A, B, C, A, B, C, and A, B, A, B in the order. In and as for the second question, mm, the normalizing of uh, this spectrum, this channel on uh, this has a um, carbon gap, and in each experiment that we held, we measured this so called flags uh, channel from the uh, fresh uh, sample that has no carbon, there we measured the absorption spectrum on the uh, margin of uh, absorption. And we got flux channels. And then we uh, normalized them using experimental spectrum. And thus we eliminated this gap. And as for misprints, certainly I can just agree with that and beg your pardon for this negligence.
So, is that it? Yes, if I did not miss anything, then it's it. Okay, okay, I'm satisfied with the answers that you gave. But I would like to draw attention to the fact that why it's not clear why did you use this flux on tungsten, not on cobalt, because we used um, tungsten crystals. This uh, film of cobalt was applied on tungsten crystal, but the graphene was on cobalt, not on graphene, uh, not on uh, tungsten. But yes, but in cobalt, after this coating, it already has carbon that won't allow to uh, get flux. We need a sample that does not contain carbon. Uh, the difference of flux you see. Okay, I just got it roughly. So, distinguished colleagues, as far as I got it, there were no questions remain. No questions remained. And you were satisfied with the answers that you got from the candidate for the degree. Were there any comments on that? Okay. If there are no comments on the answers, let's move forward. Does any one of the guests want to speak out? Well, I have no information then. Maybe no one wants to speak out. Okay. Any questions submitted online uh, via our website? No, no questions were submitted. Okay. Okay. Then we no longer take questions. So, what do we have left? Uh, we are going to listen to the thesis supervisor now. Dmitry, Dmitry, please, you have the floor. Professor Sachov. So, the microphone. Okay, thank you. Yes, I am the thesis supervisor, Dmitry Sachov, and I would like to say a few words about the personal contribution of uh, the candidate for the degree to our work. First of all, the work itself is quite a complicated one, and it required a lot of samples and a lot of experiments to be held in different places in our lab and on the sources of synchrotron radiation. And the author took part personally in all experiments that were described in this work. And he was the author of projects that were submitted for um, uh, in order to get time on the synchrotron uh, sources experiments, and we held these experiments successfully. And it should be mentioned that he personally spent a lot of time uh, and and uh, efforts of working on this synchrotron radiation source in order to synthesize samples and, and carry out um, experiments. Uh, and he, well, Victor successfully mastered these methods of uh, production of high quality samples described in the thesis. And he produced a lot of them. He personally participated in data acquisition. He got this absorption spectra, photo emission spectrum, the data of diffraction of emitted electrons. And um, above experimental work, um, Victor also mastered the package for theoretical calculations that were uh, given here, this um, software packages for the calculation of electron structure. And also, he successfully calculated the chemical shifts and different structures that coordinated well with the experimental data. And he also carried out the calculations of uh, stability of different model structures demonstrated here 
including oxygen atoms introduced into the layer of uh, hexagonal boron nitride. And actually, this improved the credibility of the experimental results. And well, I had a very good impression of his work. As for the work itself, yes, a lot was mentioned that there are a lot of inaccuracies. Yes, I fully agree with uh, the problems mentioned by opponents. Certainly, we could have used terminology more uh, accurately um, and to read the text better. But uh, uh, the fact that he had to prepare two thesis texts in English and in Russian, so maybe that uh, had a certain impact, and unfortunately, our author was not quite ideal working with the text. But overall, I liked uh, this work. It's quite logical, and it uh, gives all the ideas in a correct order. Maybe the literature review should have uh, been should have uh, been fuller, but still, it does not diminish the value of this work. I believe. Therefore. First of all, I, I would like to say that he contributed greatly uh, personally to the overall um, investigation, to the overall study, and the work, I believe, deserves the uh, academic degree of the candidate of sciences. Is that it? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dmitry. OK. Dear colleagues, anyone else willing to speak out? No one. Yes, everyone already mentioned everything that they wanted. OK. So any questions submitted online? No. No questions, and we no longer take them. Yes. OK. Therefore, we stop the discussion and taking questions. So the problem is as follows. We can discuss this work personally in a closed manner, uh, switching off the broadcast, if there is such a need for that. Uh, so I ask the members of the board if there is such a need for that or the result is quite obvious and we have nothing to discuss in a closed regime. No, I believe everything is clear. Yes, I do, do believe the same. OK. OK, I join in. Mm -hmm. Therefore. No need for this uh, technical uh, break and close discussion. And now we switch to voting procedure. So it's 3 p.m. Uh, 50 minutes Moscow time. The question to the members of the board is as follows. Uh, distinguished colleagues, we are not making a break before the vote. And we shift to open balloting then. First of all, let's check if we hear and see each other, everyone. So we, yes, we do. We hear and see each other. OK, OK, yes, we do. OK, then I raise a question on the award of the academic degree of candidate of uh, sciences and physics in mathematics in specialization 010407, condensed metaphysics to Viktor Shabalev. We're going to have an open balloting. And let me remind you that the decision of the dissertation board on conferring the academic degree is positive, provided more than 50% of the board members, but not fewer than three people voted in favor. That's in conformity with section 23 of the order on the procedure of granting academic degrees. So uh, step by step, Yelena, what's your opinion? I believe that uh, we should uh, award the academic degree of the candidate of sciences to Victor. Andre, what about you? Yes, I support. Uh, Alexander Vladimirovich? Yes, I also vote for the award of the academic degree. Professor Grunais, what about you? What's your opinion? I also vote for a conferring degree. Thank you. And I, uh, Chairman of the Board, Alexander Vinogradov, also vote for the award of the academic degree. Thus, dear colleagues, as a result, 
uh, five uh, members of the board voted for the award of the academic degree. No one voted against the award of the academic degree, and no one abstained from the vote. And finally, the decision on the award of the academic degree um, of the candidate of sciences and physics and mathematics in specialization. Uh, 010407 condensed matter physics uh, to Victor Shevelev is made. And finally, we give the floor to our candidate uh, for the finalizing remarks. So please. First of all, I would like to thank you so much to the time that you spent on the reading of my work. And I'm really grateful to all the members of the board and to all the um, members of our department, academic department, and I would like to thank my colleagues from my lab. I would like to thank my thesis supervisor, Dmitry Sachov, and I would like to thank my previous um, scientific supervisor, Mr. Shikin, who taught me in the during the bachelor course and the master course, and certainly I would like to thank. Uh, I would like to thank my um, friends, my relatives who supported me throughout this uh, way, starting from my bachelor studies up until present point. So thank you, everyone, for being with me. Thank you. So what we have left is just the congratulations, and we congratulate our new candidate of sciences, Victor, on behalf of our board and on behalf of the department, of our department, I would like to congratulate you and to wish you further um, successful work. Your field of study is quite a good one, and I would like to see further developments. I would like you to achieve further um, success, and maybe in future you would provide us a second thesis, maybe not at once, not in five years, but maybe in ten years. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. We congratulate you, Victor. And I therefore close our session. And I thank all, all the participants, all the members of the board, and everyone present for taking part. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Right. Thank you. Yes, congratulations. Thank you.